please turn your Bibles, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Um, most of you uh, got a book this evening. I know not everybody did, but I know most of you did. If you did not get one of these, uh, we intend for everybody to get one. Uh, more than just each family, um, each adult, and, and actually even uh, middle school on up that are going to be in this class. The class that, um, that Delane was talking about Sunday morning and, and the uh, meeting time, that we're starting it two weeks from tonight, and we're going through this book uh, called Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ uh, by Leroy Brownlow. Um, it is very much a classic. It's been around a long time, and uh, we're going to go through it in the spring quarter, and so we're going to have... Uh, ages 5th grade up through. So we've got 70 books, so we intend for everybody in the class to get one. So if you didn't get one, please come and, and get one. And um, if you're taking one to somebody that's not here and you haven't told me that, let me know that. But we know who's getting books. So anyway, um, should be enough for everybody. And we start that two weeks from tonight. So it means we've got to finish up Hebrews between tonight and next week. Okay? Should be able to do it. So, Hebrews chapter 12. Also, uh, while, you, while you're just finishing getting there, one more thing about the study. There are 25 different reasons given in the book as to why he's a member of the Church of Christ, why, why he states that. And so, given that we have 13 weeks for classes... We're going to cover two per week, and so that's what we'll do. Also, um, what, what I'll also do with that is, by this next Wednesday, which is a week in advance, I will give to everyone um, a list of uh, questions, supplemental reading, things like that, to go with each one of the, the uh, points that we're going to be looking at, so that you can, as a family, have some things to talk about, go over, and deal with before you come to class. So what we'll be doing is two, two of the questions. And if you just look at it uh, in the book, the first two questions cover seven pages. So now I realize that there's some things that there will be passages you mentioned that you look off of, but it's not real intense reading. Um, it's something that you as a family can you know, go through in a couple different evenings and, and should be able to do pretty well. Maybe do one, uh, you know, do two evenings on one and then two evenings on another and, and you're ready for the next class. So anyway, shouldn't be that hard, but also encourage, uh, you know, families studying together and like we did with the uh, big picture study. Okay, Hebrews 12. We looked um, up through verse 11. We were talking about how the, that, uh, that God disciplines us, that we are disciplined, and it's one of the ways that we know that we're children. You know, um, if you're going to be a part of the family, then God is going to exert discipline upon you, and, 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 and that's just a part of it. If he didn't care about us, if he didn't want us, if he wasn't going to claim us as children, then he really wouldn't care what would happen to us. So instead... Uh, it's a part of his love, it's a part of his care for us that discipline comes. Um, the text also makes it very clear that we are better because of it. We are trained from that discipline that comes. So, that brings us to verse 12. He says, Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be Put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it become, many become defiled. Okay, let's let's stop there. You know, the intention of the discipline is to make us ready, to challenge us, to make us better, to make us stronger. Very much like um, 
Why do, why do people lift weights? Why do people exercise? Well, you know, it, it doesn't seem to make sense that you make yourself really tired so that you can be better. But that's the way that works, isn't it? You, you exercise your muscles. You work them. You lift things. You run. You exercise your body so that the next time you do it, you can do a little better. Or that once you recover in a few hours, that your body is able to do things better. Your, your blood pumps through your body better. You, your mind is clear. And, and just whatever you have, that, that it strengthens you. And so the challenge and the difficulty that you go through make you better. And, and discipline in some ways is like that that it strengthens us. And so his point is, is that we, that we lift our drooping hands. We strengthen our weak knees. We are invigorated and strengthened by the challenges and the difficulties that we overcome. And so by that, we are able to do better. And then from there, in verse 14, he says, and, and this kind of begins a, a section that, that to a large degree runs us through the rest of the book, and that is um, just a listing of different things that the author wants the people to get as he brings the book to a, conclu to a conclusion. And, you know, a lot of these subjects aren't, there's not a lot said about them like, like there were about previous subjects, but yet there's a lot in this, this stretch that we're looking at. And the first thing in verse 14 is, Strive for peace with every, for with everyone. Okay, you know, one of the words for fighting is strife, isn't it? And strife is a is is strife is the opposite of peace, isn't it? And so that concept, rolling that concept around of striving for peace. You're, you're a warrior for peace, so to speak. You're, you're fighting for peace. You're doing all that you can to bring that about. You know, um, you see the, the, uh, the beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, you, you see that concept of being a peacemaker. And, you know, when you think about that and you think about what, what it takes to be a peacemaker. A peacemaker makes peace where there isn't peace. And a peacemaker is not somebody that stands off in the corner and doesn't get involved. That is ambivalent, <laughs> just a, a spectator. A peacemaker is someone that wades into the fray and helps fix what's out of line. A peacemaker makes peace where there isn't peace. You can mind your own business and stay out of the way. And there's a benefit to that. And there's a time and place for that. But, but striving for peace and being a peacemaker means you help people work through where they are and help there be peace where there isn't peace. And he says, and for the holiness without which no one We'll see the Lord, you know, and, and uh, I mentioned holiness last week. And, and when you look at that and that word and, and really if there is, if there's one word that, that well, let me let me say it this way. The, the word that I feel encompasses God the closest of any one word, and that's probably holy. Um, it touches on a lot of what God is. Um, is you know holy is something that is set aside that is that is unique and special and it's holy because of its purity and its perfection and its all all of those things that God is and that we are able to participate in the holiness and that we get to uh, we get to share in that because of um, because we've made ourselves um, to be like Him and we are trying to, to live like Him as, as best we can. And so holiness is, is uh, required out of us that we, we try to set our, 
ourselves apart. We try to strive to be like the Lord. We try to serve the Lord the way that He wants. And so holiness is some, not something that happens by accident. You know, we don't have a pure heart. We don't have a holy heart because we accidentally have one. We, we intentionally, purposefully need to guard our life, guard our thoughts, guard our attitudes, guard our actions in order to, to be a person of holiness. Then from there, verse 15, he says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. What do you see in that? Is it possible to fail to obtain the grace of God? Okay, well, that, that's the first thing I get out of that. It's possible to, to fail in that. What are, what are they to... They're, they're to make an effort. They're to see to it. Make the effort. Right there is something that is they are told to do in order to obtain the grace of God. Now, do not misunderstand. You do not earn the grace of God. None of us deserves the grace of God. But it is obtained. And how is it obtained? Well, we... We do what God has asked of us to obtain that grace. And we must see to it. We can't fail at it. We can't fall short of it. We must see to it. We must obtain it. Um, the grace of God forgives us. The grace of God cleanses us of our sins. But we get the grace of God by submitting to Him in faith, by, by uh, repentance of our sins and turning away from where we've been by confessing Him as our Lord and by being baptized and washed of our sins. And, and from there we, we continue to have it and obtain it by way of we continue being faithful. None of that requires us and none of that is expected for us to be perfect. But yet there is a see to it, there is an obtain it portion of grace. Even though it doesn't matter that we earn it, we, we can't. We don't, we don't deserve it, or else it wouldn't be grace. But we do need to follow through. We do need to obtain. And that comes about by our determination, our effort, our submittance to God's plan and obedience to God's plan for our life. He then says, so that the root of bitterness... So that, that doesn't happen. The, the root of bitterness does not spring up and cause trouble. And by it many have become defiled. The root of bitterness. How, how is bitterness as a root? Okay? If you don't have peace and you don't have holiness and you don't have, you know, yeah, you can become bitter. And a lot of times... Bitterness starts out small. Bitterness starts out as, you know, we got it wrong. We, we get wrong. We have something happens. And then we think about it a while and we think, they meant that. Or did they? No, they had to have meant it. Well, I'll just see if they say anything later. And then days and weeks and months go by, and what happens? You know, bitterness becomes a, a grudge and a, and a wedge, and, and, and you don't treat them as nicely as you used to, and, and they throw it back. And, you know, just from a little root of bitterness, and it may merely be that one or the other of you are just simply having a bad day, or that you didn't mean what you were saying to sound the way that it ultimately did. You ever, you ever said something that people took horribly wrong and you didn't intend, didn't intend for that? I think every one of us has had that. But if you let that stuff go and you let that stuff grow, it becomes a lot worse. And it certainly is. It certainly is. It's wasted time. It's wasted energy and effort. And all it does is destroy us. And so, you know... 
you know, things like envy and jealousy and bitterness and all those things are, are about as silly as drinking poison and expecting the other guy to die. Because that's essentially what you're doing. You're poisoning yourself and expecting the other person to get poisoned. Because that's all to do to you. You know, it's about that, about that foolish. And certainly letting that go. Now, you know, like we had with one of the questions um, a couple weeks ago, you know, can we forgive somebody that doesn't seek forgiveness? Well, well, yeah, you can forgive them. Now, if they don't want forgiveness and they're not seeking forgiveness, well, then that's on them and they've got to answer before God on that one. But, but you are not obligated in any way, shape, or form to hold on to that nastiness in your heart. You can let that go. You can forgive them as far as you're concerned. You can wipe that clean and you can walk away from it as best you can. And so you don't have to hold on to it. Now, if they refuse to repent and they refuse to change, well, they'll have to answer to God about that. But you control what's in your heart and what stays in your heart. And so don't let that root of bitterness grow up. Don't let that stay. You get rid of that. And you've got to get rid of it all the way down to the root. It's just like some of these, some of these invasive vines around. You know, multiflora rows. Oh man, you ever had a you ever had a battle with multiflora rows? You know, some genius got an idea of bringing that over and making fence rows with it. John Vixer. Yeah, I don't know, but he's a he's a cousin to the guy that or, or the same type of person that brought kudzu to the south. Oh man, I don't know if you've ever seen kudzu, but it just takes over. It just takes over. Hillsides and fields, and it's just everywhere. It is evil. Mark's cousin knows where that stuff came from. Yeah. Earl Rogers. In this in this area, yeah. yeah. But it 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 was before that somewhere else in the United States, but it's not even native to the United States. Mom and dad invited uh, two people to dinner one afternoon. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. So, anyway, yeah, yeah, you, you you recognize how. Back to my point of what that is, you got to kill that all the way down to the root, because it'll spring back up. Yeah, you can you can bush hog that, but hey, that only counts for about a month, you know, because it'll spring right back up. Uh, yeah, crossbow might. Yeah, crossbow. Yeah, I know, that's, yeah. Yeah, crossbow is a, a high-end uh, poison, you know, you put on stuff. It's not just a crossbow. No. But, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good poison that gets it. But it's still, you got to get all the way down to the root. Um, what, what did you say, Lois? It was more on the spot than what we were saying. That's right, it takes over your life, yeah. It takes over your life, and that's the idea. You let that root grow, and it just... Just like multiflora rose takes over a hillside and it's a mess and it's nigh into impossible to get rid of when it gets when it takes over. The the you get that root of bitterness there and it'll it'll just take over your life. It just runs your life. It 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 makes you be the way you are and what a what a uh, what a sad thing that is. And so, you know, uh, to you, a wise man once said, you know, nip it, nip it in the bud. You know. Oh yes, definitely. I yeah. think this is a real serious uh, passage of scripture when we really get down to looking at it. Oh yeah. You know, not only what it does to us, if you look at the rest of the world, look what it does to other people. Yeah. I would not want to stand before God having defiled somebody else or caused somebody else to right. or keeping them out of heaven because yeah. of my root of bitterness. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yep, 
That's true. Okay. He said, um, you're exactly right, because, you know, that defilement separates you and separates others from God. We need to be very, very careful of that. And we, we don't let that uh, take root. We don't let that grow in our lives. In verse 16, so that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he had found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Here he says that no one is to be sexually immoral. And, and then he goes on to say no one is to be unholy like Esau. And, and all of these things are really going back to what he said earlier about holiness, that we've got to put all these things out of our life in order to be holy, to be right with God. And we, we don't hold on to any of these things. We don't hold on to this, uh, to sexual immorality. We don't hold on to just unholy thought and attitude like Esau. What was unholy about Esau and his, his thing? Well, he, he didn't hold value to what was valuable, and that was his birthright. What, you know? A momentary thing. A momentary thing, one meal. What was that birthright? Well, that was more than getting dad's stuff, okay? That birthright was a lot more than, than getting the big tent and a few servants and, and it was flocks. Holy, it, was made common, what it was something whole. And, and, of course, when you recognize that the birthright coming for Jacob and Esau is that they were grandsons of Abraham and the promise by God was that through the lineage of Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so undoubtedly, you know, I, Isaac was told that, and then Isaac, as, as a patriarch, would have told that to his sons. And so here is the promised blessing of the family. Their grandfather, Abraham, has had the message about how that all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through them. I mean, after all, their dad is the one that Abraham was going to offer on the mountain. Do you think Isaac told that story to his kids? Of course. They knew, they knew those things. And so, you know, when, when you recognize that family and what the birthright and what it meant, and Esau didn't hold that as important, that's, that's what that is all about. Like I say, it's not, you know, who inherits the tent and the servants and the, and the flocks. It's about something far, far more valuable than that. It is to be the, to have the birthright in the family that is eventually going to be the ancestors of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Esau isn't a part of that lineage because of that. So, he wanted it later once he got his belly full, but, but it was too late then. And certainly, um, you know, there are consequences for things that we do. And so, um, when we make harsh and rash decisions, then they come back to get us. Okay, 18 and following. Um, says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness, and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear, but that you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God and judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than that of the blood of Abel. This book is winding down, but... He draws the mind back to the Israelites. And the Israelites are at the mountain, Mount Sinai. When God gave 
the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law and told them about the tabernacle and how to build it and all the things associated with that during the two times that Moses went up onto the mountain. And he drew on the fact that it was so fearsome that no one except Moses and Joshua that went up to assist him was able to touch the mountain. Not a single individual, not a single animal, nothing could touch that mountain. And no one even dared to do it. There are a lot of those times in the Bible that a line got drawn in the sand, so to speak, and people crossed it and suffered the consequences. There's no indication that anybody messed with that one. That the presence of God on that mountain was so awe-inspiring and and intimidating that nobody went on the mountain. And so, no one did this. And yet, as awesome and amazing as that was, that's nothing compared to what is assembled before us you see, we've looked at a couple different different avenues about how that, that old law and that old covenant were types and shadows and, and, and all copies of what was going to come. The original that was going to come. And he says that there's all these things and that, you know, that God is going to be the judge of all in verse 23 and that the spirits of righteous were made perfect but then here at the end he, he, he straight he brings it to a point and he says unto Jesus and look at what we've seen through this book the mediator of a new covenant and the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel Abel was innocent blood we saw that early in chapter 11 that, that Abel's innocent and righteous blood speaks and continues to speak. But his blood was very, was just a, a type, a shadow, a copy of what was going to be much later be a purely, completely innocent blood. Abel was not a sinless sacrifice, but Abel did not deserve what happened to him. And so when, when Christ dies, His blood, it is the mediator of the new covenant, the beginning of that new covenant, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And that is, speaks greater and more powerfully than the message that the, the blood of Abel spoke. Any questions or comments? You know, you've got... You've got this great setting in the Old Testament, but, but that's nothing compared to what we have now. The, the witness, the testimony that we have of, of God and His Son, and He is the mediator of the new covenant. It is His blood that has been sprinkled. It is His blood that has been shed for our sins. And it was for evil intent. And of course, Christ died from the same kind of thing. I mean, that you know, Abel, Abel was killed because of envy and jealousy from his brother, and Jesus was killed from the position of the Pharisees and the scribes and, and them from their envy and jealousy. And so he he in that way theirs were the same, uh, but also in the contrast that you know Christ was for for others and Abel's Abel's as a witness and a testimony but it wasn't for um, the forgiveness of anybody certainly right had, had to put a veil over him so people could look in his direction 
Yep, certainly. It's an amazing thing that uh, the way that that was. Okay, verse 25. I want to finish up the chapter uh, tonight. It says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will they escape if they reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he who has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is consuming fire. Well, this, this image that was brought, that, that Tom was mentioning of, and Moses on the mountain, no one could dare go on the mountain. No one could dare step foot on that. They all stayed at the bottom and waited. God's presence was such that the mountain shook. And Moses, who had simply been up there in God's presence, they couldn't even look at Moses because he had been up there before God. And as awesome and awe-inspiring as that was, that's nothing compared to what God has said is going to take place. And the text says one more time, it's going to be shaken again. Uh, much like when Noah was told that God would destroy the earth by water again, we recognize in the New Testament that it's going to be fire. That in 1 Peter, it's going to be fire that will destroy everything. And we see here that he says that, that all things will be shaken. That doesn't mean an earthquake, but it means that everything that is not eternal, everything that is not forever, will be destroyed. And so, it will be a removal of all those things. Um, you know, so to speak, if it isn't nailed down, it's going to get, get tossed about. Well, what are the things that are nailed down? What are the things that are unshakable? They are the things that are eternal. And God is going to, at some day, going to do that. God is going to judge. God is going to come. Also, in, when you realize, too, that in the context of Hebrews, that it is not going to be too much longer. It probably is only uh, less than five years after this book's written that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And, you know, this book primary focus on this book is that Christ and Christianity and His covenant and His message and all of that is superior to everything in the past. And as awe-inspiring and awesome as the message brought at the mountain was, it's going to be done away with. The things that are eternal. You see, the Old Covenant, Judaism, if you will, was not eternal. It was never intended to be eternal. It was what God people, what God God's people to Christ, but it was not intended to be the once and for all plan. Christianity was. It was never intended to be an eternal plan. Now, people could get to heaven under it by, by way of God's grace and mercy that was given out uh, through Christ, but, but yet they, you know, the, the plan was never intended to be a permanent one. But Christ is. And so what is from before is going to be shaken, going to be destroyed, and the kingdom that is coming the kingdom that, that they were going to be receiving would not be shaken, would not be destroyed. And I think there's some rich meaning in there 
when you realize that this book was probably written in, in the 65 to 68 A.D. range, um, somewhere in there. Whether Paul wrote it or whomever, it's got to be right in there somewhere, um, just simply because of the, uh, the language and other things. And the people mentioned at the end of the book, uh, Timothy is mentioned, and uh, being in, in prison and being released from prison. And that and some other things along with it kind of give you that range that it is most likely mid to late 60s. And we do know that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70. It also talked about all through the book about, about the old covenant and the old things being in place and the tabernacle or the temple being in place. And it's, so it's always a present tense. And so that gives you the idea that it's not 70 yet when it was destroyed or else it would be in the past tense. So it's right in there somewhere close before it takes place. God's going to shake the eternal is going to last now if you need a verse to wake you up or two verses to wake you up verse 28 29 therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe so there is acceptable worship means there's unacceptable worship now that doesn't we don't have time to talk about what is and what is unacceptable worship, but realize that there's worship that's unacceptable. Okay? So just you can't just do any old thing you want to do and it be accepted. There's acceptable and there's unacceptable. We've got to do it with reverence and awe. Why? Because God is a consuming fire. Absolutely. The world doesn't want to see it. They see him as a loving God. And, you know, and he is a loving God. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. that's the only side they see. He is a loving God, or we'd already be in that fire. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But 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 you're right on, Randy. I mean, he is a consuming fire, and he is powerful, and we need to have reverence and awe for him. Um, and, you know, and we need to. We certainly need to be on the right end of that. Okay. All right. Thanks.